<clears throat> Welcome. I'm Liz Taylor, ocean explorer, naturalist, and entrepreneur. And I am Sylvia Earle, oceanographer, National Geographic explorer, founder of Mission Blue, and an ocean elder. Thank you, ocean elders, for backing this whole enterprise. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> This is our show, Dive In, where we host informal and open conversations with the ocean community on topics of wonder and interest. And we're glad to be back again and hope everyone has made some time to get out so outdoors. Um, I am going to go ahead and share the screen. Yikes. Yes. Oh. The magic of technology. Here it, we is, go. it is magical, right? <laughs> oh, my Lord. Drag it across. Yes and bring into focus that magical singular place in the universe our little blue home our little blue home is right where's our slideshow there it is yay ah. <laughs> <laughs> and as we get going here we want to remind everyone that the world is blue 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 <laughs> there it is blue miracle as we go through our conversation today um please put your questions into the Q&A box, and as we get towards the end of the hour, we'll, we'll uh, take as many questions as we can. Oh, let's see here. There we go. And this is that beautiful, she calls it the blue face of the planet. I call it the great blue back because it holds it all together. <laughs> it keeps turning around and around, so it depends on your perspective. Yeah. All right. Back today, face tomorrow. Yeah. But today, uh, we are going to talk about these amazing octopus since it is octo October. Oh, that's right. It is. And to just keep in mind that these eight legged soft bodied creatures have relatives in that group of creatures called the cephalopods, which technically means head foot pod is a foot. And among the cephalopods, we have the squids. Oh my right? Lord. <laughs> we have the Nautiluses they kind of go like this, don't they? Yeah, well, that's right. And they have their little tentacles kind of poking out. All right, we'll, like we'll, we'll mock him up here. <laughs> kind of like, like this. Yeah. <laughs> but, and they're related to snails. They're mollusks. Abalone, it's a kind of snail, but it's kind of flat. And clams and oysters and other bivalves in the mollusk family and their tooth shells as well and and some ancient kinds of mollusks that are in relatively short supply these days yeah but um we're talking about octopuses today and octopuses are getting you know a real following <sighs> for a long while either Octopuses were regarded as monsters of the deep, which they're not. A lot of them are in the deep, but um, they also can't imagine that some people actually eat octopuses. I hope by the end of this program, no one will wish to ever think of an octopus as something to eat again. And huh, soft-bodied creatures. This one of the greatest champions for octopuses was Mike Degree. He did films, told stories, created gymnasiums for octopus. And this is one example where he illustrates the, uh, what, how nimble and how squishy octopuses can be. All right, let's see what this little video will play for us. That tube it's trying to pass through is one tenth the size of its body. Squish. Oh. And away <laughs> she goes. That was from a film called Incredible Suckers. <laughs> But the diversity of these animals is just remarkable, as is their camouflage. And their smarty brains. They they figure things out. We're going to hear more about that from Jenny Hoffmeister here pretty soon. But they have good camo. They can change their colors, change their shape. 
I once had an experience with an octopus in Australia. He was out in the middle of the day, just sauntering across an open sandy place. And I stopped and looked at him, her, it, she, he, <laughs> I couldn't tell. And it really focused on me and started tiptoeing across the open space to get to the reef and on its way changed its shape, its color, its skin, went all prickly and then it went really smooth and finally it made its way over to the, the, the reef where I thought it would tuck in quickly and hide, but no, it went to the highest place on the reef and stood up on the tips of its tentacles and just glared at me. It was as if there I was trying to communicate with you and you just, you stained the same color. You didn't change your shape. What's wrong with you? It's like, I Human. felt so, I felt so, <laughs> oh, what? Inadequate. <laughs> Inadequate. Yeah, that's so weird. You look at this guy or girl with this, it's like the bioluminescent uh, frill. Yeah, we are most familiar with those creatures who live in the upper sunlit portion of the ocean, especially where divers can go. But you get below, you know, even huh, most divers stay within. 50 meters or so, and actually somewhat less than that. And we know a lot that we don't know. <laughs> We're aware even in that area, but most of life on Earth lives in the dark, below where the sunlight shines. And the deeper we now are able to go, the more answers or questions than there are than answers of the extraordinary diversity of so many forms of life, including octopuses. This This doesn't look a whole lot like the ones that divers usually encounter, but it has eight, eight tentacles, has a big brain, eyes remarkably structured like those of our own. They have totally different pathway to get to their remarkable eye structure, but similar to that of, of, or, of, <laughs> of ourselves, of all vertebrates. And here's an invertebrate with a parallel kind of development really amazing. Huh. Again, now you see me. Now you don't. Yeah, hiding <laughs> at a crack. Well, today we're really pleased to have Dr. Jenny Hoffmeister joining us. Um, Jenny, if you can turn on your camera and microphone, and we'd like to talk to you about, oh, there you are. Oh, Thank you. Great. Um, about all your research that you're focused on invertebrates, particularly abalone restoration and their ecology and their behavior, especially in the Southern California octopus, octopuses, octopi, you can tell us how to pronounce it, <laughs> what is correct, <laughs> all around Catalina Island um, in particular. It's one of the best places for people to, to dive in. You can walk right down these steps, right into the dive park, one of the longest marine protected areas there. And um, we just had a group of divers down there Monday of this week uh, out there lurking around and looking for critters and they saw a bunch of these guys. <laughs> uh, I was actually there last night in that dive park. Yeah, they're just wonderful fish. Mm -hmm. They probably eat octopus though, they can. They do, they do, yes. <laughs> and, and, and anything that can catch an octopus will eat an octopus. They're a, a, a pretty important part of, of the food web ecosystems. Right. They're called wreckfish, right? Yeah, wreckfish. <laughs> Which is strange because they were around long before there were shipwrecks. <laughs> the people to... A giant sea bass also are are um are what they're yeah. as well. But these are as, as big as some of the divers out there. But these are the guys that we're really honing in on today. Love that face. It, was, it just looks so wise, like <laughs> <laughs> So, so Jenny, what what got you interested in uh, looking at octopus and their in their and uh, and their ecosystems? It was my my start in an aquarium when I was in undergrad at UCLA. I I learned pretty quickly that I was an invertebrate enthusiast because invertebrates are kind of the weirdos of the sea, and there's lots of diversity and lots of weird stuff going on. And I just had lots of questions, lots of curiosity. If you're a scientist, if you're you know, of any type of science 
instinct, you're driven by those questions, right? Driven by that curiosity. And I worked for a little bit at the uh, Santa Monica Pier Aquarium in Santa Monica in Southern California near LA. And we had an octopus there and just mm. interacting with it, watching it, seeing how its behavior changed as it got to know me. Um, I, yeah, questions. I just had questions. Um, my, um, my, uh, my boss, my supervisor at that time, Jose Bacayao, uh, let me try some things. I think I tried to do a, uh, breeding program. I wanted to learn more about the reproductive behaviors and how to raise them. Um, learned a lot, didn't quite go as successfully as I wanted, but, uh, it helped guide me in my graduate school adventures. And uh, for my PhD, I ended up working with the Southern California octopus species, um, octopus bimaculatus, or the California two-spot octopus at UC Berkeley. And yeah, it's it's been a love affair with octopuses ever since. Well, that's that's awesome. I, I similarly um, looked after octopus uh, at the Steinhardt Aquarium, the original Steinhardt Aquarium, and just had so much fun with those guys. We were mostly dealing with the uh, giant Pacific octopus, and had the experience of uh -oh, she's more got, like this. Ah, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just about that size, maybe even a little bigger. bigger. But yeah, <laughs> but <laughs> uh oh, dueling octopi. Um, well, that one's got some battle damage. But they, um, but this guy, he would just stealthily go out of his tank, go a couple tanks down, feast on the Dungeness crabs that were also on display. Uh, and then return to his tank as if you know no one would ever find who out me? who Mr. me you know? Mr. octopus <laughs> hungry um, octopus and he was never found out I mean he went on went on for months and then he was eventually found out by one of the night engineers who just casually mentioned you know how much he enjoyed seeing the the octopus over in that kelp tank and he was like there's no octopus in that kelp tank you know? <laughs> <laughs> so they really are clever clever animals and the number of stories like that from you know lab aquaria or you know other public aquaria around the world shows that that is a that's a common thing that's a thing that octopuses do they're curious yeah. they explore the world around them they can figure it out they want to get over there they'll figure out how to get over there um yeah yeah that's such a common story to to hear that yeah so this is one of your uh little subjects here huh that is the california two-spot octopus octopus bimaculatus my favorite octopus <laughs> So tell us how they how they about their abilities to change color and and shape. Yeah, so um, I so I focus on octopuses found in uh, you know rocky reef, and so a lot of people might think that because I'm not in a in a coral reef, you know, I'm, I'm working in temperate kelp forests, um, that maybe those these octopuses don't change as dramatically or or change you know have have the crazy color changes that we might expect from a tropical or Indonesian octopus, something like that but they, they do, <laughs> they, and I think what um, I love the most is the, the textures of their skin, they can change, and you can see in this photo taken by a friend of mine, Corey, on Catalina Island, um, you can see all of the little papillae, those little bits of skin popping out around its, its mantle, its main kind of head body shape, the papillae mm -hmm. um, are all poking out, it's really trying to look like algae, um, and they can change that texture as well as the color of their skin. Um, but you can also see that like bright blue ring on the side of its head right there, right by the siphon, right by where it, you know, can squirt water in and out. Um, and that's always there to some extent. Sometimes it's much more blue. Uh, sometimes it's a little bit more muted, but that's one of the identifying parts of this octopus. And, um, you know, and, and they combine the color and the texture also with various behavioral postures. Um, I've noticed if they're kind of in the middle of the sand or not really around anything, they'll curl up their arms to kind of look like floating drift algae and, you know, <laughs> flipping along until they're, you know, so the, it's, it's all of these layers of, of mimicry that they can do that I, I, I can just watch them forever. Yeah. They're just, they're just so such cool animals and, and it's, it's goosebumps. Yeah. Only. <laughs> <laughs> magnified super goosebumps <laughs> and the and the you know the suckers themselves it's like you know one yeah. of the hallmark things of of octopus and mm -hmm. and i remember handling the of course the giant pacific and he just like whip around my arm and i'm like trying to pull it off and, and i end up with it looked like really <laughs> cupping you know <laughs> and all these big sucker marks all over the place and but they were just so curious it was, it was as if they weren't not just um 
you know, feeling my arm and its texture, but it, but it almost, it, it, I understand that they can actually, you know, they kind of taste with their tentacles too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They have concentrated neural activity in each tentacle, like having eight brains plus your central brain. Yeah. The, uh, um, yeah, the suckers are really incredible because each, yeah, covered in taste buds. So, you know, when I talk to people about this, I give the analogy of imagine if you had taste buds on your feet and you're tasting everything you walk upon. <laughs> uh, <laughs> a, a different experience, right, than, than we have as humans. Um, and each individual sucker can be controlled independently. So, you wow. know, you, you know, you try, I, to truly control your fingers independently. And we just, we just can't do it, you know, unless you're, you have some crazy bodily control, but each individual sucker is controlled independently, which is probably why it's extra hard to get them to peel off because each sucker's kind of doing what it wants to do. Um, yeah. And yeah. And they have the, the amount of nerves that they have spread throughout their body, not just kind of in their centralized brain is, is crazy. And that's, you know, one of the reasons why they're capable of the things that they are is because those, that nervous system is all throughout the body. Um, and a large, large proportion. And, you know, I, I won't say numbers right off the bat because I'll have to fact check myself. I'm not remembering right away, but, uh, (laughs) you know, a large portion of those, of, of their nervous system is contained in their arms. Mm -hmm. And they're just then. So here you've got got one that's been recently captured. And what's going on here? Yes. So that was captured for uh, some of my tracking work, um, uh, which I think we'll talk about a little bit later. Where I'm trying to figure out the movement of octopuses around Catalina Island. Um, and I, I I like thinking about. I think movement is a really important and informational thing to learn about any animal. You know, you think about if you didn't know who I was and you put a tracker on me and watched where I went for a day or two, you would learn a lot about me, right? You'd learn where I live, what my favorite stores are. If I go to the dog park, do I have a dog, who my friends are without ever saying a word to me, you could figure out quite a bit about who I am. Um, and so that's, that's what movement can teach us in, in looking at animal behavior, where they go, where they don't go, and help us understand kind of those in the moment decision making things that they might be challenged with as they move through their environment. Yeah, they, they, they're they not carrying a smartphone around, so they're not being tracked. You know? <laughs> Google, like Google Maps underwater would really save my career, but unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, look at this guy. It's so pretty. Yeah, this, this is, is how they're, you usually see them kind of sh- sh- through the water column, right? Yes. Yeah. You see them if they're, you know, really trying to get away, they'll, they'll do jet swimming like this. You can also see the, the cloud of ink. Um, this wow. is another photo ink. by my friend Corey. Yeah. So that kind of little brownish greenish in the middle is, yeah. is the octopus inking. Um, so is he trying to tell you he's not happy? <laughs> I, I imagine this octopus was not happy with me, yes. <laughs> but I, uh, I've now used this this photo for many things. So I, I hope the octopus understands how famous it is. Yeah, yeah. yeah so, so this is the process of the tracking, yeah. Yeah, tell us about how, how you track them. Yeah, so... I've done two different types. One is called a, an active track, which requires you to sit on a boat with a hydrophone in the water and follow the animal around, you know, maximize that signal, try to, you know, like you're trying to maximize the, your cell phone signal, look for the, the, the greatest number of bars, but that's the signal that the tag and the octopus is, is emitting that I'm following. And that gets me, you know, kind of fine scale, um, information about where the octopus is, is from like a minute to minute basis. Um, And then I've done another type of tracking called passive tracking, which sets up an array of acoustic um, equipment in the ocean and you tag the octopus and using triangulation. So similar to what our phones are doing right now to know exactly where we are communicating with the satellites. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, if three of those receivers got a position on that octopus and that octopus is tagged, uh, then we could get an uh, idea of where that octopus is in space. So, you know, requires collecting them um, and 
to reducing stress as much as possible because you know the whole point of understanding their natural behavior is to maintain the natural behavior as much as possible really minimizing mm-hmm. that stress you know minimizing the interaction we do everything we can as scientists to to try to you know respect that um you know of course i am still manipulating the animal so it's not a totally natural behavior i do recognize that but you know we do our best um yeah we bring them up to the surface we measure them uh determine their sex um yeah so would you like to learn how to tell the sex of an octopus <laughs> absolutely <laughs> time for my time for my uh my props here um <laughs> so and you can you know practice on your on your octopus at home um so if you look at them from the top with the eyes um kind of pointing up and their mantle this head part pointing down you know they're bilaterally bilaterally symmetric so you can draw a line straight down the middle and they're the same on both sides and these arms are labeled right right one two three four and left one two three four very creative i know um but on females all of the arms look exactly the same on males, the third right arm, so one, two, three, is a specialized reproductive arm. And the very tip doesn't have any suckers on it um, to aid in, you know, in, in sperm placement inside the female. There's a groove down the side of the arm called a hectocotylus. Uh, that's like a sperm conveyor belt, essentially, and helps deliver the sperm. And so you can see that on the arm of a male. Um, and that's how you determine the sex of an octopus, your new party trick. Very good. <laughs> we all learned something right now. <laughs> <laughs> so what happens if the male octopus loses that particular arm? Will it grow back uh, for reproductive purposes? Is it going to differentiate uh, that if they, if, if they grow back or do they grow back? So they, one of the the coolest things about octopus is that, well, okay, there's many, there's many cool things. I'm not going to be able to pick one. (laughs) One of the very cool things is that they can regenerate their arms. They can regenerate their limbs, um, which is really important because they're a super, a really uh, important prey species as well. There's a lot of things that want to eat octopus and there's a lot of things that will just take an arm and and go away. Um, There's really cool work done by Dr. Kelly Voss, who just graduated from UC Santa Cruz, um, looking at kind of that that arm loss behavior and the contributions that plays to the ecosystem. Um, if there's a, you know, a, a side of the body that they lose more often than not, but they will grow them back. And it's, it seems to be more rare for a male um, to lose that sex arm. As you can imagine, that's a very valuable part of the body. He's right? checking it. <laughs> Like not that one. <laughs> um, uh, but it does happen occasionally and they they will they will grow it back um and hopefully grow it back at enough time to reproduce before right. uh, the lifespan ends. So some of these octopuses, and I think the California one that you're working with, they they don't live much more than a year, right? Yeah. So very, how do they they have to grow grow pretty fast if they're going to restore a lost appendage Mm -hmm. they do they have to grow uh relatively fast they only live for about a year or two um and they're what we call semiparous so which means they just reproduce once and then they die like salmon and so um you know they'll they can meet with multiple other individuals but so this is a video of me catching an octopus um and i use vinegar all with you know various appropriate permissions Okay, I just grabbed it <laughs> um, to kind of entice them out of their den. You know, it's just an irritant. It doesn't damage them in any way. Safe for the environment. A little bit Grabbing chaotic. Up. Yeah, a little chaotic. But it, I mean, this, this little clip kind of really shows what it, you know, what it's like to kind of be a science diver too. You know, that it's... It, it's not to, it's not just recreational, but you're you're doing a lot of things in addition to kind of checking your your life support system. But you've got to be looking after the animal and and you know getting all your other work yeah. and measurements done too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I'm uh, an right active now. diver. Okay, so this is the tagging process, and I know I know it looks a little harsh, um, and so I just want to you know I wanted to share this just to so people could see what the process is like. I'm using sterile piercing needles to go through the skin. 
Um, it's a, actually it's a relatively quick process and securing it all down. Um, this is the this is the the tag that's emitting, um, you know, emitting that that frequency emitting for for the tracking system. Um, fun that's fact, though, <laughs> it, it, you know, I I imagine it's not comfortable for the animal for sure, but we try to go as fast as possible. Um, there was actually some research done looking at anesthetics and if that was a, a more beneficial way to to do this type of invasive procedure and they actually found that the recovery time was longer and the stress was more with anesthetics um and so it was better just to you know like a, like the piercing of an ear you know just to get it done and let them chill so after this we put them in a bucket with some nice clean seawater with the lights out and let them kind of recover um, until their colors were coming back and they were behaving as we would expect before um, releasing them back in the wild. But uh, a funny thing I learned is that, so as you, you might have noticed, I um, used, you know, I, I screw and screwing down those um, those nuts. Uh -huh. They can unscrew those. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I would. I would not. <laughs> I don't blame it. I don't blame the octopus at all. Um, but yeah, we, we learned that they can unscrew that and, uh, started, um, started gluing them in place afterwards because, you know, they just reach inside themselves and yeah, like you know. be gone. <laughs> <laughs> so the other part of your, of your work is really focused on the, the white abalone, um, you know, it's one of the most endangered, um, abalone species that there are. I don't know what species this, this one is, is but New it's Zealand one. New Zealand one, but, yeah. but it gives you an idea of kind of the the basic shell and and you know it's one of these animals that, that people have just like rampantly can over consumed for years mm -hmm. uh and, and now they're just in in really you know tough yeah. place they're, they're, yeah, it's not the otters it's not the octopuses it's the humans who are decimating the abalone yeah so look in the Mirror, oh ye who eat abalone. Right. But uh, but Give tell us break. But tell us how your work and work with the abalone kind of uh overlap each other. Yeah. So, you know, in, in Southern California, um, especially, we have seven seven different abalone species. Um, right. and you know, if you look at the history, the history of abalone in California is a really interesting and rich and long one, you know, from, you know, there's a cultural significance to it, both for the native peoples that were here and for, you know, those who have come after. Um, and so, but the fishery part of it, they saw these abalone as this unlimited resource, you know, and mm -hmm. so it's a kind of a classic example of what we call serial depletion, where they started depleting one species, saw that was going down, moved to another species, saw that was being depleted, moved to another species, and just kind of jumped across all the abalone species until um, most were gone. And so the uh, white abalone is the first marine invertebrate to be placed on the United States endangered species list. So it's a federally endangered species, a federally protected species. Actually, here I can. This is this is white abalone oh. shell. <laughs> yeah, very good. Nice. Uh, also a black abalone shell, which is another one, uh, also uh, an endangered abalone species in California. Um, but they are so because they were the first marine invertebrate to be placed on the endangered species list. There's a lot of concern and effort being placed, um, and a lot of manpower put towards restoring these species. And you know, I could talk for a whole other conversation about the role of abalone in the ecosystem and kind of the benefits of doing this type of work. But my, my role is, is the predator expert. So it's, it's definitely a challenging thing because we raise little baby abalone, put them out in the wild and predation is natural, right? You know, we are, this is an ecosystem. We want it to be a healthy functioning ecosystem and it, things will get eaten. Abalone will get eaten. That's just the way it is. Um, yeah. But we want to, you know, mitigate it. We want to, especially in these early moments. So the photo you see on the screen, um, I don't think people, most people couldn't see the octopus unless I put the little circle around it. But, um, you know, this first period where they're being released in the wild, they're stressed, they've gone from, you know, lab or farm and they're like, oh my gosh, I mean, you know, what's happening? I've been experiencing predators for the first time. They're very stressed, they're very vulnerable. And so I'm trying to find ways to reduce um, that kind of initial mortality until they can get settled into their environment and, you know, act more like a, like, hey, 
lunch. Lunch. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I want to know if you've ever put a tag on an abalone diver. Oh, an well, abalone uh, diver. We should. Track <laughs> their movements in relation to the abs. <laughs> uh, yes, I know that some some law enforcement that has happened. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> But, I mean, what a great, what a great face, you know, that they've got. Look at that. Look at those eyes. You know, they're, yeah, each one, like every octopus and every diver, they're all individuals. Mm -hmm. they're, they know two exactly alike. Each one has a, his or her own DNA mm -hmm. and personality, if you will. They behave differently. Uh, yeah, and I, I think the the diversity of personality in, in octopus is certainly much bigger, larger than an abalone. You know, their development of octopus brains and their nervous system kind of allows them for that. But I, it's, it's pretty easy to convince someone that an octopus is cute, right? So one of the other things <laughs> I like to do is, but abalone are cute too. Look at those little eyes, yes, look at the are. little face. <laughs> and, 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 and each one ha is an island. I mean, they have their own forest and their own collection of, of I mean it's like an ecosystem that crawls around <laughs> like like an, an island every one mm -hmm. um and the white abalone are a little bit unusual in that they they don't seem to move around that much they'll find like their one little rock and just stay there for months if not years on end there's some um adult abalone white abalone that we could go back five years later, it's in the exact same spot. Wow. Um, so, you know, it, it, it makes tracking them quite easy. Um, so yeah, so this is actually a time-lapse camera that was put out for, I think it was five months and a photo was taken every half an hour, I believe. Um, and it, you know, it doesn't move. It doesn't move from the frame of the camera. It has its little rock. It catches that drift kelp that moves by um yeah that kelp is gone <laughs> <laughs> well hungry hoover yeah Look at him. One of my favorite things to do diving is to feed abalone you know take a little bit of kelp and put it in front of their their face and they they grab it yeah jump really, on it yeah it's really fun that's amazing um so because white abalone don't move around as much and they are uh you know they also are a little deeper they were they were prized for for their meat um and so that's why they were you know so many were were taken um during that intense fishery period and mm -hmm. so i work with a bunch of partners um this is dr kristen Accolino, um at uc davis and the bodega marine lab handing me some white abalone this picture is from the very first white abalone outplant or the release of captive bred white abalone into the wild um, you know, there were, this was done in 2019 and it was, they were first listed in 2001 and before that, my colleagues and, um, you know, those scientists who came before me were working towards this moment. So this was a very special moment in the history of this program and in the history of, you know, working towards the restoration of this species. And we've now done this four more times. We're actually going out next week <laughs> to release more in the right. wild. So this is an ongoing thing. And um, there's a lot of really amazing partners that are part of this work. And it takes an incredible amount of people to, to, save, to save this little snail. Um, and I am certainly honored to be part of this work. It takes a long time, doesn't it? From a newly hatched abalone and they go first into the water column as plankton and mm -hmm. then have to be attracted down to the right kind of substrate. Mm -hmm. And what is it, eight years or so before they can start making abalone of their own? <laughs> yeah, um, it's there's still a lot we don't know about abalone reproduction and the timing of it. Um, they have a very short period of time in the plankton. It's only about seven days. Uh, compared to, you know, something like an octopus that might be a few weeks or a few months, a lobster that's a year, they have a, a very short time that they're floating around as little planktonic guys. Um, and in the captive breeding program, they go through those first few stages in, in the lab. Um, you know, they, they go out of the plankton, we settle them down, um, grow them to a certain size. We aim for about at least 25 millimeters, which is, you know, not super big. Um, 
but they reach that at about two to three years old. Um, and then when they're three and older, they'll start trying to, those that stay in the lab, they'll start trying to induce spawning and start trying to, to see if they're ready to, to release sperm or eggs to, to make new babies. Um, but it seems to be very inconsistent. <laughs> um, yeah. So, you know, it's kind of hard to tell who's going to spawn and who's not going to spawn. It's a, you know, a lot of really, um, really smart people are working on that to, to try or to get the even, even how long they live if some human doesn't pounce on it. Yeah, so uh, at least 30 years. We've been... 30 years? At least 30 years, yeah. So and we think a lot of it... right here. Oh yeah, there you can see the little white tag moving around. Um, so yeah. this is a time lapse of some abalone. These are actually red abalone, um, a different species that we kind of use as our little bit of our guinea pig species, uh, just to test some. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the I think I see an octopus. <laughs> I think I saw an octopus like slide in there. <laughs> it was the lobster. The lobsters will eat them too. You know that it's. So it, it, it turns into a little bit of a, of a numbers game, you know, as many as we can kind of put out there, you know, will increase the chances of some of them surviving to reproductive adulthood, which is, which is the goal. The goal is that, you know, enough will reach reproductive adulthood and we can just step back and let nature do its thing. Um, right. Yeah. Yeah. So there's sure. some more crawling out and around. <laughs> Yeah, I saw the one, the one octopus just kind of like shoot, go through the frame, you know, so, <laughs> it's like, you didn't see me, did you know? <laughs> and the, these, this time-lapse camera is a little bit faster. I think we're taking a picture. I want to say every 30 seconds for this one. Yeah. Um, quicker. Yeah. And so these are, these are actually white abalone. So these are all captive bred, uh, white abalone that have been released. Um, we use these little, um, deployment modules to help reduce stress. Um, abalone are unfortunately hemophiliacs. So if they get too bad of a cut on their foot on the underside, they can bleed to death. So we try to limit how many surfaces we have to transfer them onto. And so they go into these tubes and we take the whole tube down from the boat and, and put it um, in some good, some nice rocks and stuff. Um, I, can just, I can just envision like the octopus coming in like sticking its tentacle through that hole. And <laughs> I'm tasting yeah. abalone. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I have done some research too, looking at, um, is there an octopus deterrent? You know, if so we, we ended up coating some abalone shells in uh, organic beeswax, uh, which is also something that's used to try to kill um, epibionts, kill some of the stuff growing on shells of wild caught abalone. Mm -hmm. um, and the octopus, didn't like abalone with wax with a with a nice wax coating um yeah. but it was a it was time consuming to to apply that and you know it's with a lot of this stuff it's a balance of resources and time plus stress on the animal yeah there's a lot of things we're taking into consideration when we when we plan for these events and and really try to maximize the survival of the abalone right. well it, it's an example of there's no there's no latitude for humans as predators that you, you mm -hmm. know what looks like an a super abundance like there's an excess down there that humans ought to be able to go in there and just take what they want but that's the insurance policy that the creatures have they, they have to account for disease for predators you know mm -hmm. for certainly for predators and for for some storms or other things that would would affect their more their well their existence mm -hmm. and humans come in and take way more than would normally be lost and okay. it, there's there's just no room and why do we need to take them anyway we don't need to it's a matter of a habit and a kind of a luxury market that's developed it's using these ocean wild creatures for money yeah when you saw abalone it's not it's like selling a songbird. Yeah. And, and the octopus too. And the octopus too. Right. There, you know, there, there is a really important cultural component too for abalone, especially looking at, you know, the native tribes in California and the role that it's played. 
and a really important cultural part for for coastal Californians as well. And so, you know, I, I think that's that's an important thing to think about. But I understand your perspective. Yeah. No, it's it's one thing, like when the native Californians, the humans, took some because it was sustenance, but they never got to take what is possible to take today. Um, the market wasn't as as um, <laughs> great. They were. We never took them in such large quantities that it, it had the impact on on their survival. Well, it used to be, you know, it used to be where the, the ones that were primarily taken were the ones that would be in the like in the shallow environment. They'd be in tide pools. They'd be yeah. a few feet underwater, just within range that you, where people could get them at low tide. On a you know on a really low tide, you could collect them. Yeah. Um, but those were of course rapidly depleted, and now um, you know we see a lot of um, the poaching that goes on where they, you know, the guys are using scuba equipment and, mm -hmm. and going out and just, you know, like filling a whole bag <laughs> and, yeah. and taking animals that are, you know, many, many years old. Uh, well, when the deep water, deeper water ones were protected by their inaccessibility, that was like over the last a couple, lifeline. <laughs> couple thousand years when people lived in, and relied on the natural systems for sustenance, but it's not the way it is anymore. They're just considered free goods that you can either dine on as a choice or you sell them. Yeah, for a lot of money. Yeah. So but anyway. Here you've got the abalone tagged, I see. Yeah, that, not as painful for the abalone, I guess. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a, it's a glue that um, it, it cures with, with seawater. So it's, it's soft until you put it in seawater and then the seawater hardens it. And I think the coral restoration uh, scientists invented this and it is, Cool. <laughs> that's really nice and it helps us keep track of you know who's surviving and for how long um and um you know also keeping track of mortality we co collect all those shells can figure out kind um, of try to figure out what ate it look at those patterns you know as scientists we're always looking for patterns we're always looking for yeah. um you know, it's to, if we could predict everything that's going to happen, I think that's all we really want. But nature will never let us do that. <laughs> Especially like octopus will always, always do something you don't expect them to do. You think you know what's going on, and you they they teach you no, you do not. You do not know what's happening. Yeah. Um, but you know, we do what we can to keep track of the animals and and use that survivorship and, and mortality to help inform kind of our next steps. Do we need to put out more? Does it need to be in a new site? Do we really need to pay attention to the octopuses? Do we need to be paying more attention to the lobster? That kind of thing. So we're yeah. constantly gathering. Yeah. Or even if you could put them in deeper water and, you know, what can be done to make sure they've got that adequate food supply? Because so much, so many areas along the coast, we're now really seeing a huge decline in just in the kelp. So, you know, mm -hmm. do they really have enough food for to uh, to prosper and to as for um, you know cover and and habitat protection right so and so yeah, the, uh, these are the, all your partners yeah yeah all, all of all of my partners again there's a you know my my postdoc advisors and my graduate advisor and my co-authors and colleagues you know, it, it takes a, a big team to do any kind of work like this um both as you know scuba divers especially there's it takes a lot of us to get work done underwater I wish I could breathe underwater. That would save a whole lot of time. Um, but you really have to be very thoughtful about the data you're collecting and how you're doing it. And so super, super grateful and honored to be uh, in partnership with all of these organizations, especially funding from NOAA, um, because the white abalone is a species in the spotlight. So it's um, the only invertebrate on the species in the spotlight list uh, where a lot of resources and manpower are being put towards trying to prevent this animal from going extinct. Um, and yeah, and I was brought in as the as the octopus expert, as the predator expert, and thinking about kind of that side of things and and looking at it, you know, kind of more holistically and this kind of ecosystem view of of restoration ecology, uh, because yeah. predation is natural. The oct octopus is going to eat the abalone. That we're not going to stop that. Yeah, um, they will. Yeah. Stop, right? <laughs> natural process. Um, and so just understanding more is kind of my my role on the on this team. No, it's really good because, you know, so oftentimes we'll see like a, a really intense restoration, you know, focus on like a species in the spotlight. And then you get somebody that comes in and they're like picking off the natural predators to kind of help the the uh, 
you know, the animal of interest. And like, it's, let's get rid of those dreaded otters. Yeah, otters yeah. are, you know, here in Alameda, we have the, the least turn and, and you'll mm. get, you know, wildlife services out there shooting at the hawks and, and you know, animals that would normally predate on them. And you're kind of like, that doesn't wait, make wait. sense, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so, you Look know, in the mirror first. Yeah. So kudos to you for, you know, for really looking after the octopus, even as we're trying to work on uh, restoring the white abalone and, and other, and the kelp itself, you know, it's, um, it's all kind of in trouble. It's, it's a systemic ecosystem problem that we're, we really have to start addressing. Mm -hmm. And the climate is changing. It's going to continue to change and we need to, you know, those dynamics are really complicated and that's why there's such value in working with lots of different people with per different perspectives and different expertises so you can see how all those components go together um, and right. try to get an understanding of, yeah, that big holistic picture. Yeah, no, it's really important. It's when we talked about seagrass meadows, um, you know, the last time mm -hmm. we talked about like all the different animals that are reliant upon those uh, those grasses and in that that entire ecosystem and it's very true in the kelp forest mm -hmm. certainly so we're gonna, we're gonna jump into some of the uh, questions questions. Yay. questions yes <laughs> <laughs> um let's see question octonation the largest octopus fan club here just saying hello and thank you for spotlighting these magnificent creatures um, all right, we've got to find if we've got some questions, but everybody's just excited to see <laughs> see uh, octopus being Octonation's a pretty yeah. uh, a pretty fun group if you're if you're not familiar. It's, <laughs> it's just you know the octopus enthusiasts we find each other. Yeah. So uh, James is asking, how long can an octopus survive out of the water? Mm, that is a great question, um, especially as we opened our conversation and talking about leaving tanks to go into other tanks to eat Dungeness crab and cause it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> There's some really cool videos that people have captured of them coming out of tide pools and crawling across land. Um, mm -hmm. So with a, like the, with a lot of marine species, especially invertebrates, as long as their gills stay wet, they can do some type of gas exchange. Um, you know, usually they're not out of the water for more than a couple minutes, but I think you know, I, I, I speak from experience only in that they're very good at escaping as, as evidenced <laughs> by that tube video you showed at the beginning. Oh, right? yeah. um, anybody who has tried to keep an octopus knows that there, if, if there's a way out, they're going to find that way out. Right. Um, and yep. so when I was in, in Roy Caldwell's lab, we certainly had some escape and found them alive, you know, hours later. Um, because they had escaped and couldn't obviously couldn't find their way back to the ocean. So they are capable of staying out for, for a long time. Um, but voluntarily, it's usually only to get from one tide pool to the next or to get to that tank with the Dungeness crab. Oh yeah. Like the only way we ever kept that those guys in eventually is we put um, AstroTurf all around the, the perimeter of the tank and they really disliked the, the texture and probably the taste of the, uh, of the AstroTurf. So they, that, that's the only thing that finally kept them in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they have very sensitive skin. That's why the, the vinegar works well to, to get them out of holes if you need them to come out is they, it just irritates them. And they, yeah, that, yeah. the cleanness of the AstroTurf, um, yeah. yeah, irritates them. Yeah, it's kind of, you know, <laughs> I don't like it either. Yeah, it's like, I don't want to go there. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, Hannah is asking, she says, thank you for the talk. So what have you guys found in terms of how octopi impact the abalone? Are they a significant predator? And what would you guys do if you found that they were a high source of the mortality for your hatchlings? That is a great question. Um, they are a significant predator, an important predator, but kind of what we've figured out is that if there's a low number of octopuses to begin with, so we do a lot of surveys before we release the abalone, um, surveys over the whole site where we're keeping track of wild abalone that are there, um, you know, other, you know, other predators, in addition to octopus, like some of the, the bigger fish or the lobsters, um, big sea stars. And we found that if the initial kind of density of octopus, the initial numbers of octopus is pretty low, then it'll stay low. They won't, they will be there. They will eat the abalone, but not to a point where, um, you know, it, it's overwhelming the, the numbers that we're putting out there. When we have done sites where there was kind of an initially high density of octopus, a lot of them to begin with, even before abalone were there, even though we removed some octopus and tried to move them off the site, 
you know, more came in. Um, and so, uh, yeah, the, probably the theme of this is if the octopus wants to go somewhere, it's going to go somewhere. Um, so just trying to find those sites where there's a naturally lower number of octopus for whatever reason, reasons we don't quite understand yet is, is going to be our best shot. So that's what we, that's what we've been doing, um, in re recently is these sites that we're focusing on right now kind of have naturally low numbers of octopus, but are still good habit, is still good habitat for the abalone. And we haven't really had an issue. Yeah. Have you, have you been able to find out like how deep the octopus go? Oh, this particular, so yes, I mean, they're all over the place. So in Southern California, we actually have six species of, um, of benthic octopus, you know, that's not including the crazy weird deep guys, you know, we're going to have to get into the submersible to really find those weirdos. Um, but let's in terms of, <laughs> let's go, yeah, <laughs> let's go, right? let's go. <laughs> um, so, but the ones that you might encounter while scuba diving and certainly occur in the depths of that, that the abalone are, um, yeah. we, we do technically have giant Pacific octopus in Southern California, but they're usually very, very deep in the deeper, colder waters. Um, they get caught as bycatch sometimes for some of the really deep fisheries. Uh, we have two different two different two spot octopus species. One is octopus bimaculatus. One is octopus bimaculoides. Super convenient naming convention. I know it's really great. Um, yeah. <laughs> and they're both smaller. Um, we have octopus rubescens or the red octopus. That one can go also decently deep, a few hundred feet. Um, we have octopus californicus, which is a or the big eye octopus and it's also a little bit deeper or actually a lot deeper that one kind of borders on the are we a deep sea octopus are we not um and then we also have the smallest octopus species smallest known octopus species in the world i will say um the it doesn't even have a common name it's so there's so little known about it it's called octopus micropiercis and they live in the holdfasts of kelp and they also have really big eyes wow. and little, they're very I think they're very cute, but <laughs> they're so small. All right, we gotta, go, we gotta go find some of those. <laughs> yeah, and they're not a danger to the abalone. So let me just put in my quick question. Yeah. And that is, so who eats octopus naturally? And have we lowered their numbers artificially by fishing? Mm, you know, that's a, that's a great set question. set this natural balance of things out of whack, but because we've taken so many of the elements out of a natural healthy mm -hmm. help system yeah so and octopuses are certainly in this you know they they're kind of right in the middle of the food web which makes them really important both as a predator and a prey item um, but that also means that yeah if their numbers increase that could impact their prey if their numbers decrease that could impact their prey um and anything that can catch an octopus will eat an octopus. You think about it, they're, they don't have any bones, they're soft and squishy, it's just like solid muscle, right? So um, bigger fish will eat them, smaller fish will try to poke at them, seals, sea lions, dolphins all will eat, um, all will eat octopus. Uh, moray eels are a huge predator for octopus. We have uh, moray eels in California. Um, some of the research that's been done with that, that like their stomachs are just full of octopus, just full of octopus. Wow. Um, and some, so some of the, some of the bigger fish certainly have, um, you know, are, it's, it's, it's hard to understand where we are in Southern California. There's a, one, you know, one of my postdoc advisors, Paul, Dr. Paul Dayton, um, has a paper on shifting baselines. And that's something I yeah. try to think about a lot, you know, in terms of, you know, my experience, my short time on this earth, I know how it's changed, you know, in, in the last 10, 20, 30 years. Someone who has exactly. been in the ocean for 50 years, 60 years, has seen their baseline of change is different than mine. You know, looking back a million years, that baseline of change is different. And keeping that in mind, you know, as we look at how ecosystems change, just because what we see now is, you know, what we see now is not necessarily the way it has always been. We're already looking at an impacted environment. We're already looking at an environment that has been altered by humans and altered by climate change and things like that. So it's a, yeah, that's a, it's a tough one to answer because I don't have a time machine. I wish I had a time machine. <laughs> yeah, that would be really nice. It would yeah. give us a better, better view or window on, on what work, what level of work we need to, to do to try yeah. to do better restoration effort. Mm -hmm. All right. A couple more 
questions while we have mm -hmm. about five more minutes. Um, an anonymous attendee is asking, uh, similar to the octopus teacher, have you developed a relationship with one or more of your special octos? And what's the longest uh, distance time that you've been able to track a specific one in the wild? Uh, so the the benefit of and truly what I'm what I'm envious of for the the filmmaker who made my octopus teacher is he had the freedom and ability to go out every single day to the same spot and really get to know that area. Um, I unfortunately don't get to do that. I wish I could. Um, and so I have not ever had a relationship in the wild. I certainly have in the aquarium um, where, you know, they they get to know you. You're the person who brings food. Okay, hello. You know, you walk by and they'll come out and, and wonder where their food is. Um, and so but they are relatively short-lived, right? They live for a year, maybe two years. Um, giant Pacific octopus can live a little bit longer in the in an aquarium than in the wild, but still, you know, relatively short-lived. Um, so yeah, I would say that the, you know, for the length, for, for a year, the, the lifespan of an octopus that I had an aquarium had, you know, recognized me, recognized at least me as the food, as the food bringer. Um, but in the mm -hmm. wild, I unfortunately don't have uh, the flexibility to be in the water every single day as much as I, as much as I wish I could. I don't know. It's a, it's a typical of, you know, science divers everywhere. You just never get enough time but in the how field. How long have you been able to track one? Um, we, well, so the octopuses are smarter than me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so for some of the, the active tracking work that I've done, we were only doing um, 24 hour periods of time. For the uh, passive tracking where I set up this acoustic array, we had the, the battery life of the trackers, of the, of the, the tags on the octopus were for a month. So I was hoping to get a month. Um, but as we discovered, quite a few of them just kind of unscrewed the whole unit and threw it out. And we found the tag unscrewed and disassembled on the, on the ocean floor. <laughs> <laughs> Some of them moved around uh, the area for a few days. I think, I think a week was the longest we got. And then it just left, just left the detectable range of our, of our receivers. So yeah, they're smarter than me. Work, work to be done. Work to be done. All right. Carolyn is asking, is there a species of octopus that you've never seen, but you'd really like to? Oh, I Ooh. have never seen a mimic octopus in the wild. And I would really. Oh, like yeah. That's top on my list, I think. <laughs> they are such amazing creatures. They really are. They look like, I don't know, anything they wish, I guess. From <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> So, all right, a question from Ed. How many more white abalone out plants are planned and will you continue to be uh, supported for that work? Yes, so um, we are supported through NOAA. There's a, a grant called the Section 6 grant that's specifically for the restoration of endangered species. Um, and so that's primarily what supports our work as well as Fish and Wildlife's you know, support and part of my job description. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, we have, it's, you know, this is where I call it job security, right? This is, this is a long-term <laughs> project. Um, it, it'll take 10, 20, 30 years before we know whether or not these efforts have been successful. And I think everyone involved understands that, you know, understands that this is, we're in this for the long haul. Um, so at our current sites, we've uh, released animals four times. The plan is to do it 10 times at a site and then just kind of let the site be and see who survives and who grows. Um, we just established two new sites that we're going to be uh, starting to put white abalone in again, 10 times, twice a year. So five years, two times a year. Um, and eventually we're also hoping to build all the sites across you know, throughout all of Southern California, maybe go out to the island, some of the offshore banks, um, and just, you know, really do everything we can to, to build the population up to, to what it was before, uh, before fishing. Nice. But the solution to restoring the abalone is not go kill the octopus. No. He's not. <laughs> <laughs> it Thankful. is so not. They are a natural predator. You know, it's, they have every right to eat the abalone. They evolved with the abalone. Um, and it's just understanding the octopus. You know, if I, if I could Dr. Doolittle the octopus, that I think that's really my dream. Um, Cause I have so many questions. 
so if I, I just want to know why they make the decisions that they make, why they do what they do, why they went over there, not over there, why they like crabs and not the snail, you know, so there's a lot of questions I have, but in the absence of being Dr. Doolittle, uh, I do science. Yeah. <laughs> or, yeah. <laughs> and we, we are at the top of the hour, so we've kind of run out of time for questions, but we'll try to answer any um, remaining ones offline if we, if mm -hmm. we can. And I really appreciate your time today and really want to thank you for being with us, Jenny. Um, we'd like to thank you and our producer, the Ocean Elders, and mostly to everyone out there in the community that keeps coming back and, and joining these conversations and learning new things and, and just uh, diving in with it. Water connects us all. Um, make us believe that dive in is really a conversational platform that the whole ocean community can get behind. And we're going to be back next time speaking with Roger Hanlon. Hello, uh, Mr. Squid, Dr. Mr. Squid. Dr. Squid. Um, <laughs> You're Dr. Octopus. <laughs> I, will, I will take that. I will, I will yeah. carry that honor. <laughs> <laughs> we want to remind everyone until then to take care of the ocean. As if your life depends on it because it does. You're here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jenny. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you next time. Thank you, Ocean Elders. Thank you, Ocean Elders. <laughs> Wait, getting their octopus. Yep. Bye for now. Bye-bye. <laughs>